Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our International Primatology Lecture Series, Past, Present, and Future Perspectives from the Field. Uh, I'm Andrew McIntosh of Kyoto University's Wildlife Research Center, and this lecture series is brought to you by um, the Center for International Collaboration and Advanced Studies in Primatology. And it's part of our graduate seminar in science communication um, based at the university's Center for the Evolutionary Origins of Human Behavior. And through this initiative, we aim to capture some of the origin stories of um, either from the stellar careers of primatologists or about the evolution of their big ideas, uh, or even the places they worked, or just generally to see what they've been up to um, over the years and to learn as much as we can from them about how things have gone. So this is the 24th uh, episode in our lecture series, and I'm really excited in a moment here to pass it over to Mike Huffman to introduce Dr. Dorothy Fergazi. Um, just a, a bit of housekeeping before I do that. This is being live streamed on YouTube, as you can see. And if anyone on YouTube in the audience there has any questions for the speaker, you can put them in the chat there and I'll be monitoring that. And for anyone in the actual Zoom audience, um, we can do it through the Q&A at the end, um, through the chat box, or just by putting up your hand and we'll get you on the stage, as they say. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Mike for the introductions. Okay, thanks, Andrew. And welcome, Dory. Um, it's it's a pleasure to have you in this series. I can't believe it's the 24th and you haven't been on earlier. Um, you've been in my in my targets of someone I'd really like to have join us and, and share their career with us. I think we've been in in the monkey business for a comparatively similar amount of time in an earlier um Talk. I think it was the fifth by a, a, a close friend of both of us, um, Elisabetta Weisselberg. She mentioned you when she first came to Nairobi to the um, I, IPS. I think that was my first IPS me the meetings as well. So we were all getting started doing things, some different levels of, of, of work. I was the lowest. I was an undergraduate at that time. Um, but I've followed your work and our, our paths have actually crossed several different times through different different um, people and different projects. I think probably the the the, the first face-to-face -face meeting was when you came here to Japan and were working in Kyoto on the main campus for a, a semester. Um, I've we've we've been at several different meetings and I've I've read a lot of your work and I think you've you've been a, a big help in in many ways when I was trying to get into some captive work to compare with my wild studies and you you've been a, a role model for that that kind of interfacing but what I remember most about Dory by the way Dory is I think the the name that her children give her and we've all just called her Dory is the same her name is Dorothy of course but um Dory has has been in my mind through through the years, someone very inclusive, very international, and very multidisciplinary. One one episode, we were we were sitting together. I think we we're sitting next to each other at, at 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 an international conference, and she was updating her PowerPoint with comments from the last speaker, so that hers her talk would include what everyone else had been thinking and and whatnot. And I thought that was really really a, a thoughtful thing and a very well organized way to to do a PowerPoint. Um, so that's that's one of the memories that I have over the years. And um today's talk, um Dory will will tell us about the whole the whole picture, things how she got started and and what she did over the years and what she's doing now, which is still quite quite interesting work. Um, so without any further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Dory. Thank you, Mike. I should share my screen now? Yep. Okay, share. Are we there? You're there. All you have to do now is to put and it I, into I presentation need to put it mode. Slideshow. Right. Okay. Okay, you're there. Is it working? It's working. Everything's good? It's all, all right. Yours. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, Mike. And I remember sitting next to you at the meeting, but I surely don't remember tapping into the PowerPoint as <laughs> I was getting ready to talk. That was, I think I had more attention at that time than I do now. I can't imagine doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thanks so much. Yes, we've known each other for a long time. Our paths have crossed back and forth. Um, 
And it's always been a pleasure to meet you. And I'm very happy to be speaking to the, the I think you pronounce it SciCasp, right. SciCasp group. Um, and I have very fond memories of being in Kyoto for several months and also many visits out to Inuyama yeah. uh, for, for lots of different reasons. So, yes, so it's a, it's quite um, uh, um, a task to think about how to summarize a career that spanned something more than 40 years. Uh, <laughs> so you're not going to get a deep intro in 40 minutes either but you know i'll do my best and without trying to you know burn your ears with words going by too fast so um at this beginning point you can see that i was at one point a child uh a <laughs> long time ago but i uh grew up in rural new york in upstate new york many people are surprised to learn that most of new york is actually very agricultural and forest and it's part of the state where I grew up was certainly like that. I grew up on a farm um, and we actually raised chickens, but my favorite animals were always the horses. I spent most of my time caring for the horses. They were my primary responsibility. My siblings did other things and I took care of the horses. And you can see in this early family picture, everybody's busy doing something, looking at the dogs or something. And I'm just looking at my horse. That's it. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do all the time. Um, we also raised sheep and um, we we showed them. We did that as a pro in a, a program that's uh, called 4-H in the United States. Uh, and it's for, used to be mainly about um, uh, children learning to do things around farming. It's broadened and it does other things now as well. But when I was in 4-H, the most exciting thing we did was take our livestock to the fair, the annual fair in the county and the state. And I took sheep to the fair and sheep actually get dressed up and they get washed, they get combed, they get trimmed for showing. And I, I did that and then I learned how to do that. And I had a lot to do with caring for uh, sheep that were having lambs and for the lambs as they grew up. As an undergraduate, I went to Duke University um, <clears throat> and I entered there in 1969. Um, and I had no idea that you could study animal behavior as a career when I when I entered undergraduate um, education. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I really had no clue. I was a rather clueless undergraduate for the first year. Um, but I took a course in animal behavior. It was comparative psychology. And um, the and my advisors suggested that I might try to find a, a, a professor on campus who was doing some work in, in animal behavior that I could participate in his lab or her lab in some way. And this was an amazing idea. I had no idea an undergraduate could do that. So I found a professor in the zoology department, Peter Klopfer. Um, he's a very well-known zoologist. You may have heard of him, but perhaps not because his, his, um, his work is now not the most current. But anyway, um, he was uh, working with uh, a group of um, lemurs at the Duke Lemur Center, which, which still exists and uh, is an amazing uh, facility that uh, specializes in primates from Madagascar. Um, so I spent a year or more looking at brown lemurs and the, the, particularly at mothers and infants. And I fell in love with doing that. And I was amazed to find out that you could, you could make a career of watching animals for your living, basically, that there was an academic field to do this. So I thought this is, this is perfect for me. And, um, I wanted to know, especially about, um, how animals form social relationships. Because when you are working with sheep, uh, can you see my pointer, Mike? When I move this, do you see my cursor? Yes, can. Okay. Well. well, when you're working with sheep, uh, the sheep, especially the breed that we had, typically had twins. And it was often the case that the ewe would accept one and reject the other. Or if it was a new mother, she might even reject any or all of her lambs. And we worked very hard to foster orphaned lambs with some other ewe, or in the end, we had to bottle feed a lot of lambs. That was a lot of work. So we were very interested 
in trying to cross foster lambs to females that were not their own mothers. So I wanted to know about that. So I did my, my undergraduate um, term paper in this class on animal behavior about maternal bonding. And um, that took me right into the primate literature because there was no literature about that about sheep. It was all about non-human primates. This was in the later 60s. Um, so when I was looking for a graduate program, I was looking for a program in primate behavior because that's where people studied the sorts of things I was interested in. So I looked for a program in primate behavior and I wound up at the University of California in Davis and my advisor was Bill Mason. And I was very fortunate in that choice because he was a wonderful advisor. Um, he's just passed away a few weeks ago and there will be um, a, a, a sort of memorial issue um, with um, uh, some comments from many of his students, former students and colleagues um, coming out in, animal, in the American Journal of Primatology sometime in the next year, I think. So if you want to learn more about Bill Mason, you can you can read what everyone said about them. They all they all said more or less the same thing. He was a wonderful person. So in Bill's lab. Um, I learned how to think about animal behavior and I, I learned so much from him. Um, he, had, uh, he had the responsibility for a, a colony of uh, squirrel and TD monkeys. Squirrel monkeys are medium to small South American monkeys and TD monkeys are about the same size and they uh, often live in the same areas. Although squirrel monkeys have a wider range, I think than TD monkeys. But in any case, he had five pairs, male, female pairs of squirrel monkeys and five male, female pairs of TD monkeys. For TD monkeys, this is a natural pairing, a, a natural social grouping because they are naturally monogamous. Squirrel monkeys typically form large mixed sex groups. So living in a male, female pair is, is not a very um, normal social arrangement for them. So I am... Um, I wanted to work with these monkeys. They were free, so to speak, at this time. They weren't tied up with other research projects. So I was free to um, decide what kinds of projects to do with them. And I had never seen a monkey before I arrived at UC Davis, not a, a live monkey. So I, I knew nothing about them. And I really knew nothing about primates in general, just what little I had read from my undergraduate paper. So, um, I just started by watching them, which is something I like to do. I really like to watch animals. So I spent a lot of time watching them and um, doing really very simple descriptive kinds of studies with them, like watching how they fed, watching how they explored novel objects, watching how they moved around the cage, how they interacted with each other, just really straight observational work. Um, so for example, we I, I made um, little, um, devices to present novel objects to the monkeys. And I looked at how they explored them and, um, and experiments like that. And doing this with, with squirrel and TD monkeys was great because it doesn't matter what you give them to work on or to do or in what setting you watch them, they are just very different from one another. And it's delightful to, to have an N of five pairs of each species and get significant results for every comparison you try um, because they're just so different from one another. So I decided to look at how they chose travel paths. Um, and I made, with a lot of help from other people, not all by myself, I made a runway system uh, out in, the, um, in, the, in this big outdoor enclosure. You can see um, that in, in my screen, I, I have something blocking the view of part of this figure, but I'm presuming that you all can see. We can see it fine, yeah. Okay, so um, this, this outline just shows um, a runway system and the solid lines were uh, permanent features and the dashed lines were places where we could put up a board and make a pathway, um, a transient pathway. And uh, so we could change around from one trial to the next where, where the path was. So I ran a series of experiments out there for my dissertation work. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about the results of one, but this just shows you sort of how we did that. We made a small safety area. So when we brought monkeys in, in a little carry box, this is the carry box I'm holding right there. Um, we went into this safety area and closed the door. So if a monkey got out of the, of the um, uh, carry box and didn't get into the testing space properly, it was, it was confined in this space. That actually never happened, but we, we, we had to have this safety area. So, um, we released the monkey into a small box here, and we, we there was a, a couple of guillotine doors at the front, so we waited a moment with um, just a clear door so the monkey could sit there and see the, the environment up in front of it. And then we raised that door and the monkey was free to come out, and it could travel down the runways, however it was going to go, and it wound up at uh, an end box, a, um, a goal box, on one side was the pear mate, on the other side was a bowl of food. So regardless of whether you wanted to see your pear mate or not, there was always food. But if you didn't care about the food, you could go sit with your pear mate. And so the TD monkeys would go sit with the pear mate and the squirrel monkeys would go straight to the food. <laughs> and they were both happy. And then at the end, I would just go up with a carry box and put it up and they would jump back in and we'd do another trial or, or they would go home. It worked very well. And what we found is that Overall, um, the, the um, I'm looking to hang on a moment, just checking my notes here a moment. Um, I'm just gonna tell you about the, the third experiment in this series. So in the first phase, um, the monkeys practiced going on one complete runway and that never changed. And in the last phase, um, they had uh, one other runway placed as a novel shortcut because all the novel routes were shorter than the training, the original training route. So um, what we found was that um, the TDs did not always take a shortcut, even when they had to pass right by it on the way to the familiar path. The squirrel monkeys always took the shortcut if it was on the familiar side, and they also often took it even when it was not on the familiar side. See, even it's three quarters of the time when it's over here, they would take that one, even when their training path was, their familiar path was that way. The TD monkeys were much less likely to do that. So um, in general, the TDs made deliberate and conservative choices to take a more familiar path, whereas the squirrel monkeys made decisions very quickly and they preferred the novel paths. So the species were clearly making their decisions using different metrics of costs and benefits. And their travel decisions fit logically with their different lifestyles in nature because TDs are relatively sedentary monkeys. They live in small familiar territories and they make repeated use of the same spatially fixed food resources and the same spatially fixed pathways. They're just little conservatives. Um, and their strong attraction to familiar places supports this lifestyle. Squirrel monkeys travel over large areas and they're more active than TTs and they find their food opportunistically and their attraction to novel spaces and novel routes supports their lifestyle. So anyway, observing how two species that in nature can live in the same forests and are in many ways rather similar to one another, but that they were so different in their behavioral makeup was, was really um, just fascinating to me. So I also looked at them in a much larger space. This was sort of in between um, a captive setting and a semi-free ranging setting. This is a um, one hectare enclosure and uh, it was built not for the purposes of my experiment, but to be um, uh, a setting for um, the permanent housing of a small number of South American monkeys. But I was able to use it before the monkeys were released in there to, to live there. And what I did was a variation of the uh, travel paths kind of experiment that I'd done for my dissertation work. Um, I built a grid system and uh, it was a rectangular grid system with interconnecting paths. Uh, and each of the corners and the two midpoints were feeder boxes. So my idea was that I could study how systematically the monkeys would travel from one food box to another to look at the um, opportunistic nature of, of squirrel monkeys travel and the very conservative and systematic nature of, of TD monkeys travel. That was the idea. Um, so we released 
each pair of monkeys into this enclosure five times for an hour each time. And all the food boxes were baited and we recorded their location at 15 second intervals. And so this was a very systematic design all geared towards a particular kind of analysis. And at the end of the hour, I went out with the same carry box that I'd used for all my other experiments and invited the monkeys to jump back in the tr transport box and they went home. And you can't believe it, but it worked every time. We never had to chase a monkey around this huge enclosure and try to catch it. And no monkey ever stayed its past its hour out in the enclosure. So it was kind of amazing, but it all worked. Um, and what we found is that the monkeys did not at all follow my design. They had nothing to, to do that was um, with, with the way I designed the experiment. They did something that I didn't expect. Um, and the monkeys explored the vertical spaces and they traveled independently. They did not travel together and they hardly visited the food uh, boxes at all. They would make one pass, one stop at a food box as they passed by on their way to the great beyond. They were really more interested in going way far away. And the TD monkeys, on the other hand, spent a fair amount of time on the runways and a fair amount of time in the feeder boxes. And then they would find some place that they preferred to stay in the enclosure and they would just kind of sit in one spot or they'd move a little bit around in one small area. So they had a very different way of, of uh, using the same, same space. So I would have one comment about this. Um, I published this big study, it was a lot of work, uh, in a book as a chapter and I would recommend to young people that they not follow that course. Don't put your strong studies in a book chapter because they're not going to be widely available to people. That might not be the case now with eBooks, but it was certainly true at the time I published this study, which was in the late 70s. Uh, so, you know, that was a lesson learned. Um, and I finished uh, in 1978 and graduated. And I, I'm still, again, saying Bill was a great advisor. Um, so then I did a postdoc field project in Venezuela. So I had, um, I, I did this project with, with capuchin monkeys, whoops, sorry. Um, and I had never seen a capuchin monkey before I started this project. So of course that was all new and I'd never done a field project of any sort. So that was all new, but I had lived on a farm. So that part of it was familiar, um, in any case, um, I worked in Hato Masaguara, which is a, a privately owned um, uh, ranch. Now it's kind of a nature reserve in Venezuela in the Llanos region, which is a savanna like mainly grassy and, and forested, riverine forests, gallery forests there. Um, and I worked with the same group of monkeys, of capuchin monkeys that John Robinson had studied previously. And you can um, find his work. Um, in, in the literature. Uh, he, was, he was an ecologist. Um, and I was uh, observing the monkeys more with an interest in what they were doing with their hands, with their foraging. Um, there had, this was in the uh, very early 80s. And at the time, it had been reported in a few places that capuchin monkeys would use objects as tools and that they were very clever and that they were um, very good at solving different kinds of instrumental problems where they had to move things around or, or figure out how to, how to get something open. Um, and I thought that would be interesting to study. So, you know, I was, I had left Davis. I didn't have squirrel monkeys or TD monkeys anymore. And I had to think about new things. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go study capuchin monkeys and I set up to do this field project. Um, so I went to study their foraging. And um, I was I conducted this field project uh, for over a period of about six months. It wasn't a very long project, but I learned an enormous amount. And the most surprising findings to me were that these monkeys that were supposed to be arboreal, actually spent about a quarter of their time on the ground. Um, and I was very impressed also by the amount of effort they devoted to biting and pulling and pounding things that they were trying to eat. They were going after hidden things and very tough things. And they, they found these very big ground snails and they were smashing them open on tree trunks. And they were diving into the crowns of palm trees and just pulling everything out. Um, and, you know, they, they were just fearless and persistent. Um, 
And uh, what I didn't find was anything that looked like them using an object as a tool, which had been reported in a few cases. Um, so I thought they were going to be fascinating to study and I was eager to establish my own colony. So first I needed a faculty job and fortunately I got one. And along with the faculty job came the opportunity uh, to form um, a colony, uh, establish a colony. So one year after returning from Venezuela, I, I already had my colony in place. Um, and I, you can ask, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you establish your own colony of monkeys that you can't just go to the grocery store or the pet shop or something and, and have a colony of monkeys. So um, in my case, I solved that problem with um, advice from a colleague at a at a uh, at an American Society of Primatologists meeting. I was explaining to, to her that I would I was eager to start a colony and I didn't know how to go about doing it and I didn't know where I was going to get a bunch of capuchin monkeys. And she said, "Why don't you write to Bill London? He's at NIH and he has." Uh, a, a colony of capuchin monkeys that he was using in some sort of biomedical project, but he's not doing that work anymore. And he still has the monkeys and perhaps he would be willing to lend them to you. So I had never met this person, but I wrote to him and I asked him if he'd be so, so kind as to lend me a bunch of monkeys. And he said, yes, that would be fine. So in the end, um, he sent me 11 monkeys, three males and um, eight females. And I had permission from my institution, which was San Diego State University, to have these monkeys come and we built a facility for them and I established a colony. And so then um, the next task was to get to know them. Um, I had only, my, my knowledge of capuchin monkeys was solely the several months I'd spent in Venezuela looking at a different species, but the same genus, at that time considered the same genus of monkeys um, in, in the wild. So now I had um, Cebacipella tufted capuchins uh, that are now, the taxonomy has changed a little bit. You'll hear about that in a little bit. But in any case, I had these tufted capuchin monkeys to study. Um, and we had some indoor outdoor caging and we were just we spent a lot of time looking at them. And we, in this case, is myself and a group of master's students. San Diego State at the time did not have a doctoral program in psychology. Um, so I had master's students and undergrads. Um, and we began to look at the way the monkeys were using their hands. Um, and we presented them with um, an opportunity to use an object as a tool. And lo and behold, they were really good at it. Um, these two center images, well, this image is um, of a capuchin monkey using a, a kind of a precision grip. This is the thumb and this is the index finger. And it's not a pad to pad opposition the way we do, we get, or that uh, old world primates get, catarins and apes, but um, it's certainly functional. Um, and these two pictures, are of captive monkeys in our group um, breaking off a, a branch from brows that we had put in the, and then she used branches like that in this uh, dipping apparatus. And it's her daughter next, we're smelling the, the um, drips that have, that have um, remained on the edge of that apparatus as she pulled out the syrup with viscous. I, I can't, I think we use some kind of maple syrup substitute, but it might've been applesauce. I mean, we tried all sorts of sweet things and they, they liked it all. So um, that was the first um, experimental evidence in our lab of monkeys using objects as tools. We were really excited about it. They also, because they manufactured their own tools by subtraction, by breaking the brows off to get the sticks to, to go use in that dipping box. Okay, so when you have a, a, a breeding colony of monkeys, especially when all of the monkeys are primiparous, that is they've never had an infant before, um, there are bound to be orphans and um, uh, monkeys that are rejected by their moms. And we had some of those, these are both orphans actually. Um, and we had to hand rear those, um, but that gave us an opportunity to learn things about them too. So. We learned a lot about the sensory motor development of, uh, of infant monkeys from the monkeys that we had to hand rear. We didn't have to hand rear many, but we learned a lot from each one of them. 
So um, I moved uh, in 1984 from San Diego State to Washington State University. So that's about 600 miles up the coast of the, the west coast of the US um, to Washington State. And uh, I took the monkeys with me. Um, and that program had uh, the program that the psychology department at Washington State uh, had a doctoral program. And my first doctoral student was Leah Adams Curtis. Um, and together with Leah, we studied generativity of, um, of uh, manual activity with objects and the development of manipulation. Um, so what we found, we, we did a, a longitudinal study, observational study. Um, we had groups of monkeys with a big window um, for us to observe into the groups and um, into each group. Each group had its own window and its own space. And we recorded on a, a 10 second cycle uh, what each monkey, a, a focal monkey was doing for, um, for 10 minutes. And we watched for five seconds and then we wrote down for five seconds. This was in an era when you couldn't videotape monkeys and then play it back and score everything. We had to have a method that we could use in real time. So the method that we hit on is a kind of hybrid between what's called scan sampling and what's called focal animal sampling, continuous sampling. We, we did as close to continuous sampling as we could reliably manage, which was five seconds on and then five seconds to write and then five seconds watching and then five seconds to write. Um, and it generated a lot of data that way. Um, and what we found is that these monkeys spend a lot of time manipulating objects this is the mean occurrences per hour and an occurrence is that it happened within a five second interval out of my 10 second observation cycle. Um, and you count up how many times that happens. You can calculate how many times per hour something occurs. And some sort of manipulative object happens for infants. These are infants less than a year old, 155 times in an hour. And for juveniles, it's more than twice that. And for adults, adults and infants are rather close, but this is an enormously large number. These monkeys are simply busy. They're busy, busy, busy with their hands in a captive setting as they were in the wild. But I didn't have uh, data exactly like that in the wild. So um, this was really interesting. Um, and about one in seven, let me go back to this, about one in seven actions that they performed were combinatorial in some form. That is, they involved an object and another object or another surface in some way. Um, and these are very interesting actions from a psychological point of view, and I'll have more to say about that later. Um, briefly, I'll tell you one reason they're very interesting is that when you use an object as a pool, that is as a tool, that that is a form of combinatorial action where you're combining the tool object with some target that you want to work with. So um, understanding how a non-human animal uh, comes to perform a combinatorial action and what it uh, and the context in which it's doing so is, is, a, is an interesting psychological um, challenge. So about this time, uh, I went to an IPS meeting in 1984 in Nairobi um, that, that Professor Huffman has already mentioned. Um, and um, at that meeting, uh, I was giving a paper reporting about the monkeys probing uh, into this dipping box using an object as a tool to do this. And Elisabetta Wieselbergi was there and she was giving a paper about how a monkey in her lab had taken a stone and smashed food and used, used a percussive tool. So we, we decided we had to get together and talk about these things because we were reporting about the same kind of phenomenon in captive monkeys. And we decided we should work together. So um, we did, we organized a collaborative project and got funding for it. And we looked at two different um, tool using behaviors or tool or problem solving, instrumental problem solving situations. Um, and we ran these experiments in my lab with my group housed monkeys. Um, and we one was a nut board with an object that the monkeys could use to crack the nuts. So we glued walnuts into this 
sort of plywood sandwich here. There's two boards and they're, they're cut. The, the bottom board is solid. The top board has holes for the nuts. And we glued the, the nuts to the bottom board. And then we put the top board on top so that the monkeys couldn't just pull the nuts out. They had to crack them. And we gave them a, a, a hard object, but we had to tether it to the board because we were watching them through a glass window. So, so we tethered the tool. Um, but they 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 figured it out and they used that object to crack the nuts. And this was a kind of, we called it a vending machine. There was a loose rod that they had to insert, which activated it so that food would come down into the food cup. Um, and they solved it. And we were looking at their, their behavior in this setting where the problems were new to every animal in the group. Um, and we were interested in looking at the social context in which this was um, was acquired by different animals in the group. And the main conclusion that we came to and that she and I um, replicated in additional studies and um, and wrote about a lot because it, at the time it was not the um, predominant view at all, was that these monkeys were not learning how to solve this novel problem through imitation. And I stand by that conclusion even now, even though there have been many studies showing all sorts of social influence, and I'm, I'm, I agree, there's tons of social influence on activity, but it doesn't meet the criteria for what people are normally thinking about as, as imitation. So Elisabetta and I worked on that for a long time, um, and we have since worked on um, lots of other projects, and our collaboration is, is still going strong after almost 38 years, I think, so... Sometimes people ask me if I'm her student or if she's my student. I say, no, nope, we're just soul sisters. Okay, so this is an example of um, a different kind of problem. Um, I moved in 1990 from Washington State University to the University of Georgia. So this was about a 3000 mile move for family and the monkeys came with me. Um, and when I got to UGA, Dwayne Rumbaugh, who was at the time the director of the Language Research Center at Georgia State University, which was about 40 miles or 50 miles from my university. In his, Georgia State is in Atlanta, and the University of Georgia is in a city called Athens. It's, it's about 60 miles away. Um, anyway, Dwayne Rumbaugh asked me to collaborate on their projects, um, and eventually I became a co-investigator on the LRC's um, big um, program project grant. And the first project we did together was to look at combinatorial problem solving. Um, and as I mentioned before, combinatorial, combining objects together is a, um, a very enduring and fascinating um, challenge to explain from a psychological point of view. Um, and we were, we were um, inspired by work by Patricia Greenfield um, a developmental psychologist who had studied how young children uh, create a, a nested set of objects. Um, and she talked about it as, as uh, occurring in three different strategies. The first is you just pair one thing with another, either small into big or big into small, and then, you, and then you're done. And the second is uh, you put one inside another and then you keep going. You keep putting one inside another, one inside another, one inside another, one inside another. And you may or may not end up with a, a completely nicely nested set. Here you put one inside the other and you don't get a nested set. But you've got three things together. It's just not a very nicely organized set. If you use a subassembly method, you put one inside the other and then you take that set and you put it inside another. And you can wind up with a, 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 an organized, uh, hierarchically organized set if you do that. You don't always get that. Sometimes you get some, some other kind of outcome, but you can get an organized set. And from her, her interpretation is that sub, sub assembly is hierarchical. And as children um, uh, get older, when they're about three or so, um, they begin to use subassembly uh, more and more, and they become more proficient at creating um, uh, nested sets of, of cups. And, and she tracked 
the development of the use of subassembly with the improvement in, in the mastery of language. And she uh, considered that subassembly was a cognitive achievement that had some of the same properties of organization as did language. So this was a really interesting idea for the, um, for the people at LRC because they were interested in language development. Um, so we, I, I can see that I'm running short on time. So I'm going to skip ahead here and just tell you that we found that monkeys and apes seriate cups. They can seriate these uh, same kinds of cups that children do, that monkeys do as well as apes, and that they do as well as children up to about two years old. Of course, eventually children get very good at this. But the point was that there was no difference between the monkeys and apes and the language trained apes and the other apes were similar. So we think that organizing hierarchical sequences of actions with the hands is, is not related to language. It's related to something else. We showed later with capuchin monkeys that subassembly can be learned. And after the monkeys have practiced that, the monkeys are as good as the, as the apes. Um, okay, now I'm gonna talk about something new. And that's our field work in Brazil. Um, this came about with Elisabetta and me, and this is Patricia Itza and Eduardo Otoni. Um, we started this project in uh, 2005. It's a long story how we got started there. This is in a Sahado area. This is a, an open woodland, like kind of a savanna-like habitat. Um, and this is what that place looks like. And you will see a monkey here soon. There's the monkey. He's cracking a nut. Wow, that's neat. So he's Dory, taking off the you, mesocarpia. You're, you're good for another 10, 15 minutes. Okay. You started a bit late. Okay. So this is what that looks like in slow motion. And I wanted to show you one where it doesn't work so well. So people think, the people have mentioned, sometimes people have asked me, do they drop the stone on the nut? No, they do not drop the stone on the nut. And people have this idea that it's a very simple action, but it's not, and it can go wrong. And this, this video shows you what can happen if you don't do it well. This is a young monkey. It's a very slow motion. Ouch. You can be harmed. You can hurt yourself in this nut cracking. It's, it can be dangerous. There's a lot to learn. This is a novice. This is a little monkey who's 18 months old. Um, and he shows you all the ways this can go wrong. You can miss the nut entirely. Yeah. And almost see what's going on inside of his mind as he tries different like, things. Like, darn. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on now? Okay. I'm, I'm going to um, not let this play to the end because, in fact, when I filmed this, he was there for 20 minutes doing this unsuccessfully, nothing ever cracked and he never stopped. And he was very fortunate that nobody had interrupted him, but in any case. Um, so we have spent many years um, studying many things about the nut cracking and the monkeys that, that, that are cracking nuts and about their ecology and about the environment in that area, the resources, the geology, the climate, the the distribution of, of the palms, the distribution of the hammerstones and of the anvils, um, many things. Um, and um, so you can, you can read about a lot of different aspects of it, but I'm going to talk just about a few studies um, that, that I've been mostly responsible for. Um, and let me remind you, this is a team effort that, that uh, Pat especially Patricia Itzar and, and Elizabeth Wieselbergi and I have been working on together for about 15, almost 20 years. 
So um, all of this is a group effort, but I'm just gonna talk about a few of the studies that have to do with nutcracking as a skill. Um, these are different aspects of nutcracking that uh, require practice and that, and that uh, show evidence of, of um, skilled performance in proficient crackers. Um, positioning the nut in the pit, preparatory actions with the stone, standing bipedally, which is not a typical stance for quadrupedal monkeys, um, the, how they grip the stone and how they adjust their grip on the stone during striking, how they orient the stone and control the trajectory so that they have a precise control, um, how they modulate the, their, their lift, how they coordinate the body movements through joint synergies, all these things. It's a very complicated um, action that they control very precisely. So they do not have the stone rolling into their ankles like you saw in that first one. This shows um, monkey, uh, a proficient monkey cracking a relatively soft palm nut with a quite big stone. And you've seen this before. So this is just another version. This is a resident human doing the same, same anvil, not quite the same stone. He got it in one crack, by the way, he cracked it. And this is um, a PhD uh, anthropologist who is having some trouble. He's, he's new to this task. He's seen the monkeys do it, but it's not something he's done before. And the idea, I, what I want you to get from this is how skillful the monkey and the resident look compared to, to that person. And this is another PhD anthropologist. Uh, and these people were experts in biomechanics, by the way, and they're trying to crack these nuts. And the first thing he does is hurt his fingers. So that's just to reinforce the idea that there really is skill in this and that the monkeys are skillful. Um, so in that particular study, we were comparing the scientists as a, as a group against residents as a group and against the monkeys as a group. And what we found is that the scientists are not any better at cracking this, at, at generating force or, or whatever they're managing. They, they are basically the same as the monkeys. Residents are, are better. This is with a heavy hammer in red and a light hammer in blue. I think the heavy hammer was about 1,800 um, grams and the, the light hammer is about a thousand grams. Um, so, you know, here's my son and here's the monkey and the monkey up in the tree is a more expert cracker than my son who's 180 pounds in this picture and has very long arms and had watched the monkeys crack nuts but was not as good as the monkeys when it was his turn. Um, okay, this is, um, I don't think I have time to talk about this, but the monkeys place nuts systematically in a particular orientation on in the anvil. And this is a short video clip that shows that if it plays. Okay, this one's not playing. All right, we'll skip that. Um, the way the monkeys orient the the nut in the in the anvil in the pit is they there's a, a pit, a small depression in the top of the anvil, and they're holding the nut and they go. They knock it on the edge and as they are placing it in, they're, they're tapping it and they move, they're moving it around. And when it feels right, they let go and then they crack it. So that's what we showed in that study. They knock it, then they place it with a very specific orientation and then they, and then they strike it. And it rarely um, moves after that. So then we asked if people did the same. So we blindfolded people and they, positioned the nut in the same way as the monkeys did. So we think that humans are also sensitive to the haptic um, um, uh, cues. Okay, and we showed later that it's the symmetric sides of the nut that are against the um, edges of the, of the pit. Okay, this is about preparatory actions with the stone. This is a monkey this, he's never used this stone before. It's in slow motion. Um, and in a moment, he's gonna go to the other side and pick up the stone. And I want you to pay close attention to what he's doing with the stone when he gets there. So does he pick it up and strike the nut? No, 
He turns a stone over, he rotates it. And then he strikes it. So that was a lot of anticipatory work that he did there. Some of it, it seems to be he was distracted, but it doesn't matter. Even when they're not distracted, they do some of that. They, they feel the stone, they turn it around, they adjust their grip on it. Um, so there's um, a, a lot of, of skill in how they handle the stone, how they handle the nut. We've looked at um, uh, how they choose a stone, We've, we've looked at many aspects of it and every part of it is very deliberate and, um, and benefits from long experience. So it's, it's a learned skill. Um, we showed also, this is back to the idea of social influences that, um, it, so this is um, data on these, these uh, we reported a lot of data in this particular article about social influences on the development of nut cracking. And this is from uh, looking at young monkeys in this, in this uh, habituated group that we've studied. Um, we, what we did was we kept track of um, what a focal animal was doing, but also concurrently what the rest of the group was doing. So we know when other monkeys were cracking and we know when in time for our focal observation, the other monkeys stopped cracking. So then we looked at what was our focal monkey doing when others were cracking and what did that focal monkey do after the others stopped? And this is a survivorship curve. So it's looking at how the um, rate of performing manipulation, manipulating nuts declined after other monkeys stopped cracking. And what you can see is that there's a lot of there's a lot going on when cracking was present. And then when that stops, it declines, it goes down. So this is not the, this is not the, the focal monkey is not cracking. The focal monkey is watching or hearing other monkeys crack. And what we showed, and it's explained in more fully in this article, um, is that the, the presence of other monkeys cracking has an enormous impact on young monkeys activity. And that the impact of the others cracking persists for a short time after the others stop cracking. So there's this sort of um, gradual diminution of activity with nuts by young monkeys. Um, and there is some facilitation of, of rare actions like picking up a stone um, and striking. So what are the young monkeys learning to do well, we, we recently had a paper, I'm sorry I didn't put the um, uh, a citation in here, but it just came out in Animal Behavior this year um, on the, uh, comparing novice, intermediate, and expert monkeys. Novices try to crack, but can't crack. Experts are really very good at it and crack almost every nut that they attempt to crack. So we measured many different things about the behavior of the novices and the experts. Um, and what this is one variable that I've circled here that that clearly differentiates the novices and the experts and the intermediates are very nicely in between. And this is the proportion of um, of uh, actions with the with the nut that were positioning the nut in the anvil. Remember that. Um, uh, uh, study I mentioned before that the monkeys knock the nut on the on, in the pit and then they release it in a very specific orientation and then they strike. So this proportion reflects the um, amount of activity with the nut that is that orienting kind of activity. And for um, experts, that's most of what they do with it. They are getting the nut in the right position and then they release it. The novices are doing all sorts of other things and they are either not orienting it very much, or they're just doing so many other things that orientation is not a very big proportion of what they do. But this is what an unskillful monkey looks like. It's, it's uh, doing many other things and not a lot of positioning. Positioning is really a very key variable. Okay. Um, 
We also measured body mass, and I'm putting this up uh, because it's an interesting thing that you might think about using some sort of, some sort of technique like this at another site. Having a body mass measure without having to capture the animal is really useful. Um, and we managed this by, this, this apparatus is actually a modified uh, stand that in our country is sold for people to climb up in a tree and sit there so that they can hunt deer. Um, but we took it apart and we made it into a stand for a scale and we put a bowl of water out here. So this is an added piece. So the monkeys would come up here and sit on the scale so that they could get a drink of water. And you can see they're not afraid of us. We were just standing right there. there. And so it has a digital readout. And this worked really well. The monkeys were keen to come get the water and they would sit there long enough. If you're patient, many trips, sometimes there were many animals on the scale. Sometimes one animal would come down and jump around and you couldn't get the, the weight. But if you're patient, eventually you get everybody's weight. And we could score body mass across years for different individuals. And you could see that the males that become alpha or drop from being alpha, uh, their weight gain, their weight varies as a function of their social status. Females weights are just very constant. Um, and the um, uh, we have weights for young animals growing. So we could show that the sexes begin to diverge somewhere around a year and a half. The females weigh less than the males, uh, but both sexes uh, grow, uh, gain body mass for many years. They don't hit a uh, fully adult weight until after six and a half years. In fact, we've tracked it, I've extended the line. It's somewhere around nine years before they are fully grown. So remember at this time, I was still running a lab with monkeys uh, in captivity at the University of Georgia. Um, in 2014, they retired to a, a jungle friend sanctuary in Florida to fresh air and green grass. And um, I've been down to visit them several times down there and they're thriving down there. So that's very nice. So um, Steve, Mike, Mike mentioned, and I guess it's true, but I think it's actually true of, of most people, at least I like to think so, that um, collaboration is really um, exciting and working with other people on a joint project is a tremendous amount of fun. Um, I think my map has moved here. I have to go, I, I've, whoops, I'm sorry. These dots, this, <laughs> the dots are shifted northward a bit. <laughs> so. Yeah, I see Italy's this, not this on there. This is supposed enough. to be South Africa, and this is supposed <laughs> to be the middle of Brazil. So, but anyway, just imagine all the dots a little bit south of where they are. Um, so I've got, I've published with people from, I have a big gap here in the middle of Africa, but um, and I have a big gap here in Russia and the Kazakhstan. And but other than that, you know, it's it's um, it's really fun to collaborate with people from all over. And if you haven't done it, I urge you to think about whatever opportunities you have for doing so. And you and SciCasp are in a good position to do that because it's an international hub. So. Um, take advantage of that. It's it's really wonderful and fun. And I can tell you from my many decades of collaborating with Elisabetta that some of the best work I ever did, we, we did together. Um, and I also wanna mention the satisfaction of mentoring. I, I taught undergraduates for 35, almost 40 years, and that was great. And many of them, I have a lot of undergrads in my lab. Also all, a lot of fun, a lot of energy. Um, and, th and that was good. And they were learning and, you know, we all enjoyed it. They enjoyed it and I enjoyed it. Um, with a doctoral student or a postdoc, a doctoral student, you've got several years to collaborate. And those have been very rewarding experiences for me and I think for them too. Um, and postdocs are not necessarily five-year stints, but they're, they're also um, a lot of fun. So, um, and... I wanted to mention about professional citizenship. This is uh, the 1998 IPS meeting in Madagascar, which was a great meeting. Um, this is Alison Jolly. And um, this is the um, Jean-Jacques, um, and I'm forgetting his last name, worked with Prosimians. Um, Mike, help me out. I'm not 
Jean-Jacques, mm, I might be Pate. I think it's Jean-Jacques Pate. Um, and ah, this, Tabatier, yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I've is, never met him. I, I know his work. And this is Hanta Ramesanana. Uh, and I don't remember who these people are. I don't, I don't know these, but they were co-organizers with Hanta of this meeting. So anyway, um, if you, whatever national society or international society you could join, you can always join the International Primatological Society. Um, I also belong to the American Society of Primatologists. Um, people in Japan would belong to the Japanese Primatological Society. And, um, you know, wherever you are from, if you don't have a, a national or regional society, of course, you can also belong to the International Society. It's it's a, a it's an interesting thing to do, and you you have you it's a great way to meet colleagues. And I thought I would mention um, because I'm speaking to a group of young people, um, and some of whom are probably wondering how you manage. Um, this is my family as of a year ago. Um, I have three children: this daughter, this son, and this daughter, and they are married, and these are their children. So we are now a pretty big family. Um, so it, it's not easy to have, um, a career, a demanding career and a family at the same time. Certainly academics are not the only people that face that challenge. That's true in lots and lots and lots of fields. Um, it, one advantage to an academic career in that regard that is less special about academics now is the, uh, the flexibility of time. Nowadays, with a lot of working at home, many more people are able to enjoy that. Um, but at the time that I was entering uh, my working life, the, the academic way of life was more flexible than the usual nine to five be in the office um, expectation for most other professions. That was always very useful to me because, um, you know, when you have children, they can get sick and have to come home. There are doctor's appointments and you can get sick. And, you know, it's just nice to have that flexibility. And I also had terrific support from my husband. And in our case, we had an intergenerational family. My mother-in-law lived with us and helped care for the children. And she liked doing that. That was her choice. Um, so we had a, a pretty smooth functioning family. That's not going to be the case for everybody. And I certainly can't um, prescribe how everyone should manage this. I, I just hope that you can figure out a way to do it because when you get it working well, it can work really well. And um, I can say that our children all grew up happy, healthy, and sound. And um, nobody was harmed by the fact that I was not the one who was there all the time. So that's, that's just some comments about that. Um, and I have a slide with the obligatory thanking everyone who supported my work. And this is a short list of the more important parts. Um, and I think I'll leave that. I think the rest is, oh yeah, you don't need to see that one. Okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> stop there. Um, and I'll open it up uh, for questions. Wow, thank you so much, Tori. That's that's an amazing story. And I'm often reminded as you were talking about the different topics, why I'm I'm always so impressed with the work you did. Um the the team that that produced the complete capuchin, I think, is um they're all you're all very close friends of mine. And um it's 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 nice to see how interactions work like that and, and last a very long time. Um, yeah, you... I, 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 I want to say Linda Fedigan there was the field researcher. When we wrote that book, Elizabeth and I had visited field sites, but we'd never worked in the field ourselves. And we mm -hmm. and, and Linda was our field anchor. And that felt so good for us to write with with her. And it was good for her to learn with us. It was it was really a good thing. And I want to say we wrote that book in two retreats at a summer home in my family. And we, we actually did write the book in two retreats. And I can say we, we wrote it together. I can say that that's a great way to do it. It really was was a fun way to write it. You you mentioned that not, not to publish, especially your early most important work as a book chapter, but I I would like to, to remind the students that publishing a book is a very good idea. I think this has gotten the most 
um, citations of, of anything that, 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 that you published. There's a lot of very high citations for a lot of your important papers, but writing a book so comprehensive and with with such good collaborations, I think is is something really important, and and all of us benefit from from work like this. So okay. I thank you for for your efforts with this. I think it's really well, really something you. that will last last a long time. Yeah, that was our goal, and and um, I'm I'm actually very happy about it. And the press is now asking when we're going to do a second edition. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I have to find a junior collaborator for that because fuck, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually, I think what that book did is it um, it promoted capuchins in a way that it's not the only reason because they would have done it on their own without that book. But capuchin monkeys have become extremely popular. Um, as research subjects in the field, but also in captivity. And in part, our book kind of um, prompted that or it sped it along in any case. So yeah, it, it did have a good outcome. Yeah, thanks so much um, for the talk. And uh, just on along those lines as well, with the second edition potentially making an appearance <laughs> at some point, um, Kasha <laughs> has an interesting question partly tongue in cheek, I think, in the chat. And I'll invite Kasha in a second to come and follow up on it. But uh, she's asking about the complete capuchin. So is that everything we we know uh, is everything there is to know about capuchins? Or are there more discoveries <laughs> to be made that maybe can appear in a second edition? But Kasha, do you want to follow that up yourself? Or are you okay with that? Sure. Yeah, I was just about to ask. Um, it just seems I can I can only imagine how incredible it must have been to watch this behavior through your eyes and make these discoveries. I'm completely blown away over here, especially the footage that you showed us of the slow motion capuchin nut cracking. That for me is really important to see because I couldn't, I didn't fathom before. We, we were very lucky to have Dr. Izar actually come and do a talk for us for an IPL previously. And I don't think I fathomed the complexity of nut cracking behavior until the second that you showed us that video. So it must have been really exciting. And I was about to ask if there was any other behaviors that you wish you could have looked into or that you think future research is going to be looking into with capuchins. And then you mentioned the complete capuchin. And I thought, oh, no, is that it? <laughs> is that everything? <laughs> well, that was so complete as of 2000 and two or three when we stopped writing it. Um, so, you know, that was 20 years ago. I asked a reference librarian two years ago um, to do a search for me just, just to see what was there, mm -hmm. not just to know what magnitude of the task it would be to think about a second edition. And she did a search with the search terms. We, we worked together on a collection of search terms and she came up with 10,000 citations published wow. between 2001 and 2021 that what? someone would need to filter. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, but I have to say there are now two uses, of, two other uses of the term capuchin that contribute to that. One is there's an AI algorithm that does something that's called the capuchin algorithm. And there are a lot of citations for that. I don't know quite what it does, but there's a capuchin algorithm. And there are, there's also the monastic order of the capuchins. So there's a couple of theological references in there too, but there's much more about the capuchin algorithm than the monastic <laughs> order. But in any case, there, there, that's in that 10,000. But anyway, of course, of course, you know, it was, um, a kind of um, hubris to give it that title, but we liked the sound of it, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yes, of course it's not complete. Um, and we're still learning a lot. And um, so your question was, what are there things that I think are going to be particularly interesting? I can tell you one thing that, that I think deserves a lot more attention. Well, there's been, um, well, several things. Um, there's been a small amount of work uh, one dissertation and then an offshoot of that um, that we published this year with Patricia Itzar, and she might have mentioned it depending on when she gave her talk, that we analyzed the nutritional consequences for the monkeys of cracking nuts. And we compared, did she talk about this? Am I telling you something you already know? Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, she, so what we found is that on the days when the monkeys cracked nuts, they, they had a more balanced nutritional profile than on days when they did not. It's not that they had so many more calories. On some days they didn't have more calories, but they had a better proportion of protein, carbs, and lipids. Um, and uh, they also, uh, as a population, spend more time, uh, less time feeding than other populations. And they spend the rest of their time, their freed up time, so to speak, in social pursuits or resting. So they have a bit of free time, which seems to be, may also reflect other resources in that environment, not just nut cracking. But as, as a whole, the, the population that we've studied, it has, they have a really good life, it seems. They're very, um, they have relatively low mortality. Infant survival is high. The population has been growing. And um, they they have a good nutritional profile. So um, we made the, we, we we made a I would say a quite um, a leap here for the for the interpretation um, to say that even intermittent use of an object as a tool in feeding that improves the nutritional profile, even if it's just natural objects and intermittent and not obligatory and not all animals do it, it still has an impact on the population as a whole. And if you think about human origins, there was a time when humans or human ancestors were not obligate tool users. They were sort of opportunistic tool users and they were using tools that were found objects. They weren't making them at the very beginning. What gets this process going? And we're, we're suggesting that it's this sort of minimal but 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 not trivial improvement in nutritional profile that can sort of get the process started. So that's that's one thing that I think would be very interesting to look into more. Um, we certainly didn't, you know, um, create the the definitive database to talk about this. It was it was a suggestion. Um, so that's something I think would be interesting. So another thing that we've been looking at is um, the the um, bipedal, stance and the, the organization of the body in cracking. Um, and um, uh, that's, that, that's really uh, fun to look at. There are a lot of new um, digital tools. There's the, 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 the ease of using video and um, marking uh, points on video without having, a, without having a full laboratory set up with reflective markers placed on the body. Um, now we can do biomechanical analyses, kin kinematic analyses um, uh, from video much more easily. So I think that's going to be a growing area, just looking at skilled movements and looking at how skill is acquired. We know from our work with Madur Mangalam especially, um, uh, the, uh, the nature of skill that proficient animals have, but, it, but it's a lot harder to uh, get information like that about young monkeys that are uh, not so reliable in where they stand. They are, um, they, they, it's a, a very proficient monkey will stand on an anvil perpendicular to your camera and go, doom, 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 doom. It just, you know, it's, it's very consistent and they're easy to analyze. A young monkey is turning around and it's got one foot off the anvil and another one on, and then it changes its position. And, you know, I mean, it's much harder to analyze. So we have much less to say about how skill is acquired from an embodied sense. Um, and, I, and that I think would be interesting. So those are just two. And we've seen a lot of other really interesting things at our site. We've seen the monkeys, they go to, um, and when it's in the heat of the day, they find a shadowy spot along a dry riverbed that's all sand. It's like a sand river. And they excavate a little bit and they tuck themselves into the cool sand in the shade. It's great. We would go, follow, we've followed them and you take off our shoes and socks if we were wearing them. The, the residents never wear shoes and socks. They wear flip-flops. I always wore shoes and, and socks because I stubbed my toes on everything. But anyway, <laughs> so I would take my shoes and socks off and just bury my feet. It was like air conditioning down there. It was great. Yeah. 
So, um, so there's a lot of thermoregulatory behaviors that we know almost nothing about. In this site, there's also um, aeolic caves. It's a wind and water uh, formed caves in these sandstone cliffs. The monkeys use the cliffs a lot, um, also for thermoregulatory purposes, as well as probably safety. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't know very much about all of that. So anyway, there's, there's lots of um, new things to find out for sure. That's and then, really and then the whole comparative comparison with other populations. I won't even get into that because that's kind of obvious. All these things that we know about this population would be nice to know. Are other populations doing the same or how are they different? There is a project that Tiago Filotico is, is uh, heading up um, comparing uh, populations in the Sahado looking to see if they if they crack nuts, if they crack the same species, if they use stones and sticks for the same ways that they do and you know how how they differ. And they, I think they call it cap cult, cap culture, capuchin culture. Um, so you can they've started to publish their findings. So you can look that up too. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's a much more exciting answer than I could have even anticipated. <laughs> oh, and that's I'm, great. <laughs> I'm certainly looking forward to and hoping for an even more complete capuchin book in the future then. <laughs> I might need a lot of caffeine for that. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Thanks so much. Welcome. Cassia, drop by if you want to, to look at the, the first I'm edition. Thank you. I will do definitely. Yeah. So we have, we can, I mean, a little sensitive to Dorothy's time here, but if there are any other chat uh, questions we could ask you. I'm okay. I'm okay, okay on time. I'm really enjoying it. So we can okay. go on as long as people want to talk. Okay. So in the meantime, I actually do have a question. And you, know, when you were explaining um, about the uh, potential for increased nutrition in the nut cracking individuals, uh, it made me think yesterday I was, at, I, I teach a comparative cognition class at Kyoto University and I was talking about cognitive buffering hypothesis. So there's some evidence that maybe um, animals that have larger relative brain sizes experience less seasonality than animals that have smaller relative brain sizes, even though they may live in the same seasonal environments. And so that basically means they experience less seasonality in their diet or mm -hmm. nutritional intake or energy or things like that. So that would make sense if the animals have to maintain some basic energy budget to feed their big expensive brains, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering then if maybe that was something you looked at with the capuchins as well there. Um, I think they live in seasonal forests, right? Yeah, it's seasonally deciduous forest, but they have a good food supply all year long. Okay. Um, yeah, and um, that's something that Patricia Itzar has tracked. She's been doing the phenology and the mm -hmm. and the biomass, and we've been using food traps. I mean, you know, it has to be something that can be done very steadily, long term. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not the uh, fanciest way of measuring productivity, but it's effective. And that's what we've used. Um, and by that measure, they have um, a pretty steady food supply. Um, so, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not able to comment myself because I can't remember <laughs> about other sites. So, I mean, for sure, there's information from from Santa Rosa about that, yeah, and probably yeah. from Iguazu from Charlie Jansen's group mm -hmm. down there, um, and probably other sites as well. But those are those are two that come to mind right mm -hmm. away, um, and probably Karen Stryer has it for Montes Claros. Um, mm -hmm. But so I, I, I'm not able to comment on the availability, year round availability of, so it, it but at Boa Vista, it's rather high and rather constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I had a question about the social learning. So I know that I, I kind of peripherally have followed this field as well. And Mike is quite involved in it. And um one of the things that interests me about it is how precise scientists have become with the definitions of the different oh. types of social. <laughs> and you yourself, in your lecture, you mentioned how you don't believe that imitation is something that monkeys will do in this arena of maybe learning how to use these, these tools and, and other things like it. But I wonder if you can um, maybe just comment on the importance or value of precision in the terms and what kinds of misunderstandings 
that you've seen come out of it and why it matters so much. And also maybe some of the definition precision can be arbitrary as well in some sense. So it, it's kind of fascinating to think on a meta level of how the science is thought about. Well, <laughs> that's a real can of worms because <laughs> there are there are many, many definitions, you know, going back to the, the turn of the 20th century, you know, in the 1900s, early 1900s, people were talking about imitation and what they meant by it. Um, and then Jeff Galef, especially in the 80s, and Celia Hayes with him, and then more recently, you know, so, and then Andy Wyden has sort of elaborated, um, to, but, you know, working also partly from Mike Tomasello from the human side. Um, so there's just been a big pl 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 proliferation, there, I got it out, um, <laughs> uh, of, uh, of work on, uh, you know, now there's the whole field of animal culture. This is uh, sort of last 15 or 20 years or so, I would yeah. say. Um, so the idea that non-human animals learn something about what they learn, something about the way they develop is different in a social setting than in one social setting versus another social setting, shall we say, um, that, that environment matters. Um, so that isn't the definitional problem. I think everyone agrees that the social context in learning is important. Um, the question is, what sort of internal processes are you going to propose are responsible for this? And um, there's a sort of, there's a um, more, more representational and less representational approach to that. You know, there's the theory of mind group and the, um, the, the, there's another, there's something MTM, I forgot, TMT. Anyway, I mean, there's a lot of acronyms about different forms of me understanding you or me taking your perspective or something. I understand something about what you're doing or I understand something because I see you doing something. Those are very, um, I would say, high level representational explanations. We, we infer those for humans because we think we experience that. We interpret our own experience and then we say, I think that's what you're doing too. Um, so the question is, can we project that into another species? And I'm really very cautious and skeptical about that. Um, but I think, I think that there's an aspect of, of um, sensitivity to social context that we haven't spent, that we haven't paid enough attention to. And that is the, the, the sort of affective and perceptual learning. Um, not that I'm, not that I'm understanding something abstract about why you're doing that, but just that you're doing that and you like it or you don't like it, but you're doing that. And it's interesting to you. It's value. You, you like, it has a positive value and I'm attracted to that. It has positive value. I'm attracted to that. Um, and so that's at an emotional level, um, not a, not a, um, an abstract, um, prospective pro pro propositional level. Um, so that doesn't also help with definition either. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not getting to definitional problems that, that requires pencil and paper and you have to parse every word. So I, I'm not sure I can give an extemporaneous mm -hmm. comment about that. I would say that people are now not there. Well, I can't really say that that's true. I don't really know if people are being more precise in the way they use imitation. And in common language, I mean, you know, in common language, it has its own uses. And the question is whether we need um, to be more precise scientifically, or should we just have it? Should we just not use that word and use other words? Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm in favor of using other words. Mm. I think imitation is never going to get us there scientifically. Mm. Yeah, it's very, very vague, and it's a you, you think you understand it, but yeah. yeah. Well, we we it it makes sense in our informal discussions with ourselves about ourselves. It helps us understand ourselves and other people. That's fine. It has communicative value, but I'm not sure it allows us to test things scientifically. Interesting. Thank you. I'm not sure that's a very satisfying answer. I'm not satisfied, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> but I, I can't give a better one. I think it perfectly illustrates the state that we're all in 
with with words and and describing what we're we're seeing and how yeah. information is is transferred it's obviously it's being transferred but people argue about the process and i've right. i've had editors or reviewers change their definitions of of imitation or or learning in the middle of a review process so we we were <laughs> you know it, it's always changing <laughs> yeah 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 i i was not not to change the subject too much but i was very sorry to hear about bill passing i i've yeah. had so many re- very positive experiences with him over the years as well he was always quick to respond and and give a comment and very friendly at meetings and things yeah. yeah, great guy. Yeah. Okay. Do we have oh, any? One, other? No, oh, yeah, yeah, Mike, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I was in the Amazon uh, in June and July uh, in Equ- Ecuador and mm-hmm. had the opportunity to see some capuchins on a little beach area before we got mm-hmm. on a boat to go down a river. And they were doing the exact same thing. They were digging a hole and they were laying inside in that uh-huh. coolness under the uh-huh. surface not far from the river. And I was amazed at that. I then I, I knew exactly what, what what they were getting from it when I saw it, but I was surprised to see them doing it. I'd never seen an a, a, a primate do that before. Right. Not, yeah. not to dig in and I, I know that's I I and nobody's written about it. I mean we I even I took um thermometer, you know, I took uh, temperature measures yeah. and it was uh, it was an eight degree difference. Yeah. You know yeah. Um, and that was just going down the depth of the thermometer, which is like about six inches or yeah. four inches, maybe, which was phenomenal. But yeah. anyway, someone can write about heat transfer sometime. <laughs> Dorothy, I have another nerdy question. Um, sorry, I have so many of them in my notes here. But uh, when you show that, Kasha already mentioned it, the slow motion video of the male capuchin who seemed to be testing the affordances of this stone, uh, mm-hmm. before actually hefting it and using it to crack the nut. And then maybe it should vary across individuals, some maybe more uh, um, mm-hmm. cautious about that and others less, especially as they're developing the skill. But it made me wonder, like uh, Patricia Izar also mentioned that you use dummy stones sometimes and you can vary the actual, like the weight. We have done that. Di- we've we've yeah. manufactured stones. Yeah, so yeah. they could look really big and heavy, but actually be quite light. And so it can mm-hmm. kind of trick the capuchins when they... So they might have this expectation that it's going to be, as usual, a heavy, big stone, but then it actually turns out to be quite light. So they, they kind of stumble. Or, But my question no, related no, they to don't that. Stumble. Actually, they don't stumble. Just throw so, it away. Um, well, <clears throat> we've done experiments with, with um, uh, manufactured stones uh, that were the same volume, but differed in mass. Yeah. So, um, and we've also done where they differed in volume and mass. So we've done all kinds of combinations. And we've also done where they manufactured the stones where the mass was unevenly distributed. So there was a heavy side and a light side or a heavy Mm -hmm. end and a light end. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, but you can't fool a capuchin. So (laughs) they they, um, will, so when, first of all, they, the first, after one trial with a set of deceptive stones, they're already attentive. Um, so they do a lot of things t- to figure out what stone to use. And they, they do it very quickly. They tap it. They just handle it a little bit. And they, if you, we did an experiment setting out three at a time. So they would, you know, feel each one and then they just go get the best one, which was usually the heaviest, but you can also get a stone so heavy that they can't even carry it. And then they'll go to the, the one that is heavy enough and not too heavy. That's the mm-hmm. one they will take. So um, you don't you don't fool them by having it be a different size or something. I was just wondering if you'd looked at at what determines a capuchin's um, decision to gather more information about a stone before using it. So almost like checking its own understanding of the situation. And I thought maybe that experiment would be a good way to look at that. Um, um, that was just kind well, of what I was. We did we did sort of look at that. So you mm-hmm. should look at the 2009 paper that Elizabeth is the first author, and it was in I think it was in Current Biology, um, where we ran an experiment which is exactly about these uh, different stones, different volume and mass, and also about um, different uh, surface textures and so on, and different composition of the stone, sandstone versus quartzite, and so on. Um, so. 
you're you're asking again how it, it was kind of it just kind of reminded me of Rob Hampton's studies of meta memory in his in those the rhesus macaques where they are checking into their own state of knowledge based on how long they last saw that sample that they need to match or something for example and it made me think that maybe this could be something similar with the capuchins where if they are relatively um experienced and can with visual information alone, get a good sense of what that rock's going to be like. And then they can, or stone, they can use it quite simply. But if you've done those experiments where you change the kind of characteristics of the rocks, I wonder if you know a little bit more about what processing is, metaprocessing is happening in the capuchin that makes it decide, okay, I need more information about this stone, but I don't need more information about this other stone. So that's kind of what I was asking. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's, you're beyond what what we can say. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't run enough trials. We don't have uh, enough cases where an individual came back to a situation, and any. I, I can't. I can't really answer that. I can just say that they're pretty quick about it. Yeah, it doesn't take them long. You know, a few taps, a little lift, and they know what's going on. Um, and yeah, I, I'm. I'm sorry. I can't really address that specific question. No, it's okay. Thanks. I had hoped that the chimpanzee tool use researchers would have followed your lead and and learned something from all the work you've done, but you you still left the chimp tool use work in the dust. I think. Well, that's not quite true now, Mike. Oh, they're, yeah? they're, um, <laughs> well, <good. laughs> um, they're they're getting there. They're getting yeah. there. Um, so, um, Julia, let's see, Julia, and her last name starts with S, and I'm failing. I'm failing to remember that. Um, my brain is fried at the moment, but Julia um, has, uh, she was working in Tai and she did look at huh. some of the kinematics of, uh, of striking and um, responsiveness to uh, stones of different mass and mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Siriani, that's her last name, Julia Siriani. Um, so she, in fact, she, but she worked with Elisabetta and she was at Boa oh, okay. for a while and she saw us running these experiments and was, it was, um, informed about the capuchin work. So so she's um, she uh, did some work like that in Thai, and I'm sure she's not the last person who will do it. Um, so um, yeah, I would say what's unusual is that Elizabeth and I both arrived in the field with this long experience of running experiments in captive settings. And we just took that experimental yeah. mindset with us and thought, okay, here we are, what can we do? And we thought, well, we can, you know, we can mark up the nuts, we can weigh the stones, we can mark the anvils, we can move the anvils around with, with wooden anvils, you can do that. We can make deeper pits, we can make shallower pits, we can, in fact, there's this picture, I'm going to show you now this one, that I'm making an anvil. <laughs> and <laughs> then there's another one somewhere. Oh, yeah. They transport the stones bipedally. That's also oh. interesting. All yeah. this bipedal upright carrying a load is really interesting. We put a force plate in the ground and they walked over it. And then we could generate their the traces of their so that so we I mean you can do these things in a field yeah. setting if you're yeah. sort of creative. And then there's this that this is a block of stone that just fell off this boulder that's behind it. We had a new anvil. So <laughs> I'm, that's me saying, wow, we have a new anvil. <laughs> and uh -huh. we looked at how quickly uh, pits formed in that anvil, et cetera. So, uh -huh. um, wow. you know, um, you, 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 you also need to watch. You need to respect the animal in its space and try to understand everything about what's going on in its space. But we also brought this experimental attitude and and i think it served us well and so yeah. you know yeah. we thought what can we do what can we bring what can we instrument what can we measure what can we what can we do and that, that was so much fun it was just you know brainstorming and thinking it's it was great it was so much fun <laughs> well it, it's you you've all of you have changed changed the the science in many important ways, I think it's like mixing the different disciplines and just what you've said, you know, taking this into a a, 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 a location and, and a discipline where we, we don't change the environment. We just see what they're doing. 
we 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 reach a limit to what we can understand but when you start testing them giving them things to work around their their flexibility becomes much more apparent and yeah i think we've learned a lot a lot more from capuchins thanks and about all species i think thanks to that yeah. that marriaging of of different yeah, disciplines thanks. and and for you guys thanks. taking the thanks. time and the patience to do that it's really important stuff well thank you yeah and then we can also have the reverse where people come from the field and and inform what's happening in the lab as well yeah, so it yeah. does go both ways yeah definitely definitely well cool. so yeah i mean you can keep hanging out and chatting. That's fine too. But I think we should probably close the event at this stage. So Dr. Dorothy Fergays, thanks very much for this lecture. It was wonderful. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here talking to us at PsychASP and uh, hopefully the rest of the world as they tune in and check it out at later times asynchronously.